Uh, hi and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A uh, warm welcome to this evening's webinar as we explore the opportunities in the Malaysian market with this overview of Bursa Malaysia. Uh, in a two-part session this evening, so we have with us the IFAS Malaysia Research Manager, uh, Jason Wong. He's here with us who will, and he will be sharing further insight into the key sectors and companies that drive the Malaysia market. He will also be touching on Sharia investing and the Sharia screening process. And then later on in the second session of the evening, Desmond Yong from our securities dealing team will also be on hand to share how investors can start investing in stocks and ETFs that are listed on Bursa on FSM1.com. So there's a lot to look forward to. Uh, do let me hand over the time uh, to Jason. Also, if you have any questions, uh, do put them in the Q&A function and Jason will tackle them right after his presentation. With that, let me just hand over the time to Jason. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The topic of my presentation is what you need to know before investing in Bursa Malaysia. Hopefully by the end of this session, you have a better idea of how the Malaysian stock market looks like, how it works, and maybe some stocks that you might be interested in. Let's start. Before I go on to the main part of the session, please take some time to go through the disclaimer. Okay, let's move on. In today's agenda, I'll be firstly giving you an overview of Bursa Malaysia, then some Bursa Malaysia indices that you should know. Thirdly, I'll be talking about Shara compliance stocks and screening methodology, which could be something new to a lot of investors in Singapore. Number four, I'll be talking about key sectors and companies that drive the Bursa Malaysia stock market before ending with a short Q&A session. Firstly, what is Bursa Malaysia? Bursa Malaysia is the stock exchange of Malaysia. It is based in Kuala Lumpur, the capital. Previously, it was known as Kuala Lumpur Stock Exchange or KLSE prior to the name change in 2004. Nowadays, you can actually use it interchangeably, Bursa Malaysia or KLSE. It, it refers to the same thing. In terms of market cap, it is about 1.8 trillion ringgit, which is US dollars more than 400 over billion US dollars and Sing dollar more than 600 over billion Sing dollars. It is the fourth largest in ASEAN in terms of market cap. So it is not small and definitely a lot of opportunities there as well. Bursa Malaysia has three main listing boards for companies to choose on uh, if they choose on to list on. So firstly, there's the main market, which is a listing board for established large cap companies that have met certain standards in terms of quality, size, and operations before they can actually list in main market. Secondly, we have the ACE market, which was formerly known as the MASDAQ market. This ACE market is, is a sponsor-driven market designed for companies with gross prospects. And lastly, we have the LEAP market, which is typically for those small, those growth innovative companies, and typically are smaller companies. So usually a small company will probably not meet, who don't meet the criteria of listing in main market or ace market would list in lead market. And when they have grown in size to meet certain, stand, certain criteria, they can apply to move into the other boards. Okay, so in today's session, I'll be mainly focusing on the main market, which are the, where most of the important companies are. The Bursa Malaysia main market comprises 759 companies as of now. Collectively, they are worth 1.77 trillion ringgit in market cap. So you can see they constitute most of the market cap in Malaysia. So ACE market and lead market, they are much, much smaller in terms of market cap. In Bursa Malaysia, they segregate these companies by these 13 sectors, construction, consumer products and services, energy, finance services, healthcare, industrial products and services, plantation, property, REIT, technology, telecommunications and media, transportation and logistics, and finally, utilities. If we look at the market cap of each sector, we can derive which are the most important sectors in terms of how they contribute to the overall market cap of Bursa Malaysia. In the right-hand side chart here, you can see half 
of the total market cap in Malaysia are from these three main sectors, financial services, consumer products and services, and industrial products and services. So these three sectors drive half of the performance of the overall, you can say the overall Malaysia stock market. Financial services will include your companies like banks, insurance companies, and so on. FTSE, uh, Bursa Malaysia and FTSE Group, they have come together to come up with a few indices to help investors have a to help investors track the performance of the Malaysian stock market. There are a few indices here that I would like to highlight. The first one or the most famous one will be the FTSE Bursa Malaysia KLCI Index, the Kuala Lumpur Composite Index, which comprises the 30 largest companies that are listed in the main market in Malaysia. These 30 companies that are reviewed regularly by the FTSE Bursa Malaysia Index Advisory Committee semi-annually in June and December. So they'll decide which 30 companies should be in the list, which should drop out and which are the new ones would take over the previously dropped out ones. After the top 30, we have Bursa Malaysia Mid-70 Index, which are the next 70 largest companies in Malaysia. And together, this 30 and 70, it combines into a FTSE Bursa Malaysia Top 100 Index or FBM 100 Index in short. There's another index, which is the FTSE Bursa Malaysia Small Cap Index, which comprises companies that are in the top 98% of Bursa Malaysia market, main market in terms of market cap. And together with the aforementioned FBM 100 Index, it combines into the FTSE Bursa Malaysia Elmas Index, which gives investors an index that tracks the overall broader market of Malaysia. So the KLCI Index is the more famous one. It only tracks the 30 companies. But if you want a more broader index to cover all the, the, all the sectors in Malaysia, that will be the FBM Elmas Index. From this FBM Elmas Index, there are other thematic indices that can be derived. For example, the FBM Elmas Sharia Index, which comprises the constituents of Elmas Index that are Shara compliant, they meet Shara compliant, uh, the Shara compliant criteria, then they're added into this index. This will be an index that is used to track how the Shara compliant stocks perform in Malaysia. Finally, there's a, another index which could be useful is the FTSE for Good Bursa Malaysia Index. It consists of constituents from this FBM Omas index that meet a variety of ESG criteria. So if you're looking for ESG stocks or an index to track ESG stock, this will be the one for Malaysia. I'll deep dive further a bit into the main indices. Firstly, is the KLCI index. As I mentioned just now, they are the top 30 largest companies in Malaysia. So the benefit of this is that it's very transparent. You know what are the 30 companies inside and you can track the performance of the index in through the website. Through It's easily available on the internet. For example, the the Bursa Malaysia website, you can find this, the index performance every day. In terms of index constituents, basically these are the who's who in Malaysian corporate scene. And you can see some of the names over here like Public Bank, Maybank, the Naga National, the Electricity Company, CIMB, Petronas Chemicals Group, Press Metal Aluminium, and so on. So these are the who's who in Malaysian corporate scene. But if you just purely look in at the KLCI index, it doesn't give you a, so it, it does comprise the most important companies, but it doesn't give you exposure or sort of those tracking into certain sectors. If you look at the right hand side table here, okay, the KLCI index would include some of the key sectors, but they lack of certain sectors like technology and like real estate, consumer products, and so on. Whereas the FM Omas index that I mentioned just now would actually have these inside the index. So it gives a broader view or broader exposure to the investor. Next is the FBM Omas Shara index, which is a subset of the Omas index over here. So basically, the companies that meet the Shara compliant criteria are in the, inside this index. And this Index is also very transparent. You can, you can get the index value every day from the Bursa website as well. So this is a good indicator for how Shara compliance stocks are doing in Malaysia. How are Shara compliance stocks selected? So basically there's a 
in Malaysia, there's a centralization of Shara decisions by the Shara Advisory Council, short form SAC, of the Securities Commission Malaysia, also known as SC, SAC of SC. So they approve the list of stocks that are considered as Shara compliant. And they do it twice a year in May and November. Currently, there are 746 securities that are Shara compliant in Malaysia, which is 80% of all the securities listed in Bursa, Malaysia. That means, on the other hand, about 20% of the securities listed in Bursa, Malaysia are Shara non compliant. Okay, so this list can be found on SC's website as well. I'll go through what are the Shara screening methodologies. Um, firstly, there's a preliminary screening. So, companies that have activities that are not contrary to Shara principles, they are classified as Shara compliant. So, those who are not, they, they go against Shara principles then there will be Shara non-compliant in the preliminary screening. Okay, Companies that do core activities such as financial services based on RIBA or interest, so these, these are financial companies like banks, typically are not Shara compliant. Gaming and gambling companies like casinos, those non-halal products are also non-compliant, Shara non-compliant. Conventional insurance as well. Entertainment activities that are non-permissible according to Sharia. Tobacco products, stock broking or share trading are also not Sharia compliant. And other activities. So all these will be kicked out in the preliminary screening part because they're core activities. If the companies are in core activities are in these, then they'll be kicked out firstly. After they pass through this preliminary screening, there's a two tier quantitative screening which applies business activity benchmarks and financial ratio benchmarks. So firstly, we have the business activity screening. Companies that derive, they look at the cumulative revenue from the non-compliant activities and non-operating interest income for these companies. So there's a certain level for companies under these activities, there are these activities in their business. As long as it is less than 5% of total income, then it's okay. Companies that have activities such as in the bottom, like hotels, share trading, stock broking, and so on, it must have less than 20% of total income that come from this. Okay, so if any of these are breached, so there'll be Sharon non-compliant as well. Secondly will be the financial ratio screening, which could be quite interesting because it actually uh, has certain benefits to investors that invest in Shara compliance stock because it will eliminate a lot of companies that are over leveraged, over debted, and so on. So this financial ratio screening has two parts, the cash over total assets ratio and the debt over total assets ratio. And the, the benchmark here is 33%. This cash over total assets must be less than 33% and the debt over total assets ratio must be less than 33%. And one thing to note is that when they look at cash, they will only include cash that are placed in conventional accounts, which are not share compliant. Whereas cash placed in Islamic accounts are okay. Okay, they will be excluded from this calculation. Debt over total assets, similarly, they will only include interest bearing debt. So if the company issues Sukho or Islamic debt of Islamic financing, then it will be excluded from the calculation. So both of these. They, they have their certain benefits, as, as I'll explain later. After the screening is done, then you have this list of Shara compliance stocks. And basically, like what, what I told you just now, is this, this Irma Shara Index Day, it, it consists of companies that are Shara compliant in Malaysia, the who's who of Shara compliant companies. And these are companies like Tanaga National, Petronas Chemicals, and so on. But what you, what you, the difference between this index and the previous chaos here index is that a lot of the banks are not in this index. So like just now you have Public Bank, May Bank, CIMB. So those are Shara non-compliant. So therefore they are not in this index. And you can see it through the, the right-hand side table here that in terms of sector allocation, the financial sector is a very small weightage in this index. So we come to this part, what are the pros of Shara compliance stock? There are certain benefits that uh, we have found okay, by if we invest in Shara compliance stocks. So far, in terms of returns, you're not actually worse off. If you invest in Shara compliance stocks, the 
returns, you're not actually missing out on a lot. If we look at historical returns, the Irma Shara Index returned 16.2% in the past five years, which actually outperformed the broader Irma Index, which returned 14.9% over the same period. In terms of risk-adjusted returns over the three years, five years, and 10-year periods, the Amas Shara Index is also better despite the higher volatility. In the past 10 years, calendar years, the Amas Shara Index also outperformed the Amas Index seven out of the eight times, as you can see in the bottom table here. So Shara, investors that invest in Shara compliance stocks may not be missing out on, uh, you can say the returns are not worse off compared to investing in just conventional stocks. Number two will be better downside risk. This is what we found after we analyzed this data as well. So in terms of volatility, the mass share index is slightly higher, but that's because if, when you calculate volatility, it takes into account the upside movement and the downside movement as well. So therefore, the mass share index has a slightly higher volatility, but it's compensated back to investors in terms of higher returns. Another indicator that we look at is max drawdown, which is how much the index drop from peak to throw, which is could be a better indicator of downside risk. And you can see that the Shara compliant index is has done much better. They dropped less over the three years, five year, and ten year periods. So for investors who invest in this Shara compliant stock, yeah, they can actually sleep better at night knowing that okay, I think. In terms of stability, it's not as volatile. I think there's a few reasons for that. One of it is because, for example, just now I mentioned the financial ratio screening. So because companies that don't meet this criteria are typically those over-leveraged companies that have too much leverage, uh, debt over assets. Uh, on the other hand, uh, these companies that are over-leveraged tend to be more volatile during uncertain periods, like recessions, because yeah, they, they need to cover their, their debt, they need to cover their interest, and there could be uncertainties in doing that. And because of that, their stocks tend to be more volatile during all these recessions or uncertain market, market uncertainties. Okay, the second reason is because financial services companies are also non share compliant. So that actually eliminates a lot of banks from this share index. And because banks are typically more cyclical in nature, they tend to be more volatile during, yeah, you, you, you can see historically, let's say during the global financial crisis and so on, banks tend to have bigger drawdowns, quite, quite big drawdowns. And by avoiding this, therefore, this Shara index is more stable and less volatile and less drawdown. So th this would explain why historically, the Shara stocks have been less volatile compared to uh, conventional stocks. Now I'll move on to the key sectors and companies that drive the Malaysian stock market. The bigger sector is the financial sector. So I'll start with this. In terms of market cap, they are 21% of total market cap. Okay, so in the financial sector, there's 31 companies. So some of the bigger ones, Probably some of you may know like Maybank CIMB, but it, it will be interesting to highlight some of the smaller ones as well that there could be interesting propositions. Like we do have foreign insurance companies. They are listed, they are local entities here. Okay, so Allianz is, uh, is from Germany, but they have listed their Malaysian subsidiary here. Then we have a insurance company that is Shara compliant, that's Islamic insurance. This is called Sharika Takaful Malaysia Keluaga Bahad. In short, Takaful Malaysia. So as I mentioned before, conventional insurance is typically non-Shara compliant. So investors who want to get exposure to insurance companies, it's very hard to find a suitable one because most of them are non-Shara compliant. But in Malaysia, we do have this. Okay, Shara uh, Takaful Malaysia is Shara compliant. Then in terms of banks, also similarly, most of the banks are non-Shara compliant. But we do have an Islamic bank. It's called BIME in BIMB. So it's short form for Bank Islam Malaysia Berhad. So it's an Islamic bank for investors who, who can't invest in like conventional banks. Yeah, this, this is one option here. And we also have the Bursa Malaysia. The Basically, they run the stock exchange. They're also listed and they're Shara compliant as well. The next biggest sector 
will be the consumer products and services sector. They are they, they are fifteen point seven percent of total market cap. There are one hundred and sixty six companies in this sector, and these are some of the notable names that I've picked out right here. So you can investors can gain and gain exposure to Gunting Berhad, for example. So they are a diversified company in leisure and hospitality. They run the casinos, but they also have other other segments. So they are you can say a conglomerate in Malaysia. The other segments include plantation, power, property, oil and gas. So Gunting Berhad could be something interesting for people who want to take who want to have some position in the reopening play. So if you think that travel and leisure is gonna boom post pandemic, yeah, you, know, you there are a few options that investors can look at. Gunting could be one of that. There are other consumer names as well, like Nestle. So Nestle, similarly to Allianz, uh, Nestle is also a multinational company. They are from Switzerland, but they have listed their local Malaysian entity here, Nestle Malaysia Bahad. So typically, if you wanted to invest in Nestle, you will need to invest in Switzerland. But actually, Malaysia, you can get some exposure to the brand as well. <clears throat> other brands, other, other companies include like QR Resources. So they are an agro food company. They produce eggs, chicken, poultry products, and so on. And I believe a, a lot of probably your poultry products in Singapore come from this company exported from Malaysia. So they also export to Indonesia, Vietnam, China as well. Saim Dhabi is another notable conglomerate in Malaysia, involved in motors, industrial logistic healthcare, and so plantation as well. So Saim Dhabi, another conglomerate in Malaysia. Mm, PPB Group, some of you may have not heard about this company, but it's actually uh, they are, it, it's actually one of the companies by Robert Kwok. So th this company, they run with a lot of F&B names in Malaysia of, or all those consumer staple brands in Malaysia. And they also run the Golden Screen Cinemas in Malaysia as well. So yeah, this, this is another way investors can, you can say, gain exposure to the consumer sector in Malaysia. And FNN is also listed as well. So this, this is also a multinational company that lists their, one of their subsidiaries uh, entities in Malaysia. Next, I move on to industrial products and services, the third biggest sector in Malaysia. And some of the notable companies here, like Petronas Chemicals. So Malaysia, you, the, the national oil company is Petronas, but they don't list that. They do list some of their subsidiaries, including Petronas Chemicals. So this company, they produce petrochemicals. So these are the, after you do, after they do the, the refining for the oil, okay, there are a lot of side products as well, which includes like olefins, derivatives, fertilizer, and methanol. So they sell it under this Petronas chemical, they process it, they sell it out. And they are quite important, uh, you can say, company to a lot of sectors as well. So for example, like we do use their chemicals to produce like gloves, okay, like your, your medical gloves. They do use a lot of petrochemicals, which is why uh, there are a lot of glove companies in Malaysia because of the, of the, you can say the easy access to all these uh, raw materials to produce gloves other than rubber, okay, is petrochemicals. Next, we have pressed metal aluminum, which is the biggest aluminum company or the aluminum producer in Southeast Asia. So they also have a lot of leverage or advantages being based in Malaysia. And their stock price has done very well. Similarly, Petrolos Chemical has done very well also since the since the pandemic lows. Okay, so press metal they produce aluminium, and being in Malaysia, it's a very strategic location because the raw materials for aluminium comes from Australia. Then they ship it to Malaysia, and their main factory is in Sarawak, where they can access a lot of cheap electricity and this aluminium smeltering process actually takes a lot of energy takes up a lot of energy so this is the advantage that they have okay and being strategically located in malaysia gives them easy access to the other markets after they have produced the aluminium as well so this is one one way investors can gain exposure to this you can say this special uh, hard to find companies okay because aluminium is actually used in very frequently in, in our daily lives. 
So some examples, your, your phones, your, your MacBooks, all, all are made of aluminum, your tin cans, your cars, a lot of the parts from your cars also made from aluminum. So your building materials, a lot of them are also aluminum based. So it's a very important element in our daily use. So this is one way investors can gain exposure to aluminum. MISC is a shipping company, logistic company. So they they run the ships that ship all these petroleum products, LNG products to all over the world. Then finally, we have Sunway, which is a conglomerate. They do they have segments in property, hospitality, retail, leisure, and so on. So those and any tourists that come from come to Malaysia would probably like. Uh, probably heard of this company. Uh, it, they, they have a lot of like shopping malls in Malaysia as well, medical centers as well. Yeah, so it's a big conglomerate in Malaysia. The another sector worth highlighting is the healthcare sector. It's the, it's the sixth biggest sector with 6.9% market cap. But it does have some world beaters in Malaysia in the healthcare sector. For example, like IHH Healthcare. So they, they actually run the, this is the holding company, but they run some of their hospitals under the Parkway Pantai brand. Okay, and they are one of the biggest hospital groups, or you can say, uh, yeah, hospital groups or healthcare groups in Asia. Okay, IHH Healthcare. There's another hospital run, uh, operator, KPJ Healthcare. So these are ways investors can gain exposure to the healthcare sector. Other than that, will be the glove makers. So Malaysia, four out of the five biggest glove makers in the world are in Malaysia, like Top Glove, Kosan Rubber, to name a few. Okay, so as I mentioned just now, being in Malaysia, they have certain uh, advantages other than cheap labor costs, but also easy access to all the raw materials needed to produce these gloves. This is where their competitive advantage comes from. And their positioning, being in Malaysia, is very strategic. If they want to ship to the US, Ship to Europe, ship to China. It yeah, that that's where the strategic location comes in. Next, I'll be talking about the technology sector in Malaysia, which is relatively small in terms of market cap, but it is the fastest growing. It is the most outperforming sector in Malaysia in the past five years, as you can see here. Year to date is up forty over percent. One year up sixty over percent. Three years hundred eighty eight percent, and five years three hundred over percent. So it's doing very well. So it is the eighth biggest sector in Malaysia main market with a 6.3% of total market cap, relatively small, but the fastest growing. So here we have some world, you can say, uh, important companies as well in the tech sector, like Hinari, Amatron, Malaysian Pacific Industries, probably, probably uh, less well-known okay, for a lot of retail investors but they do play an important part in the semiconductor value chain. So this chart here I've used to illustrate where our Malaysian technology or semiconductor companies are in the semiconductor value chain. So as probably if you are, you follow IFAS views quite frequently, we do like semiconductor sector for quite some number of years, okay, because of a lot of, a lot of structural demand, a lot of structural uh, mega trends that's happening like artificial intelligence, 5G, uh, electric vehicles, all these require a lot of semiconductors. And we see that the demand is going to be quite strong, at least for the next decade. And semiconductor companies will benefit from it. So Malaysian semiconductor companies, they tend to be in the lower end of the value chain. So probably a lot of you may know some of the, the chip makers like NVIDIA, Broadcom, these are the fabulous ones. Then you have foundries like TSMC and Samsung. So after they have produced the chip, you still need to turn them into products that can be put inside your electronical products, electrical products or electronic products, like all, all like what you see here. And after you turn them into these parts, they also need to be turned into your electron, the final electronic products. So this is where most of the Malaysian tech companies come from, and they do benefit from the growth in in demand for technology and and semiconductors globally and that's why you can see that the share price their share prices have done very well because their revenue growth have been very strong their profit growth have been very strong as well so this is one way investors can gain exposure to semiconductor value chain and because they are you can say they they benefit but the 
their their multiples or their growth rate are much big much faster than the global bigger ones because uh, the big ones uh, when, when your companies are of certain size that it's let's say okay let's say nvidia places a one billion dollar order to nvidia probably it's just like one percent of total revenue but to a lot of the small Malaysian companies yeah that's a big growth for them that's why you can see they've been expanding very aggressively building a lot of factories uh, in recent times to capture this demand so in malaysia the as uh, as mentioned just now so the technology sector is the best performing sector but if we were look, to look at overall malaysia market it is actually quite flattish okay His, in the past one year 12 months three years it, it is quite flattish so what, what i want to bring out here is that stock picking is key to outperform in malaysia and this breakdown of the performance by sector is proof of that because certain sectors have vastly outperformed other sectors so industrial products have done very well technology has done super well healthcare has done very well as well uh, so it's more of if you want to outperform in malaysia it's you the stock picking is key okay if you just invest like in just the klci index you probably you can see like in the past three years five years it's quite flattish kind of returns so stock picking is key what's the key takeaway so Number one, Bursa Malaysia is the fourth largest stock market in ASEAN with 1.8 trillion market cap. KLCI is the most well-known index to represent the Malaysian stock market. But if you want a more broader index, you can also look at the FBM Irmas index. Or if you want Shara compliant stocks index will be Irmas Shara index. This Shara compliant stock list is produced by Shara Advisory Council of Security Commissions Malaysia. In the preliminary screening, those companies with activities that are non, not contrary to Shara principles, they pass through. Okay, Those that are not, then they are eliminated at preliminary screening part. Then there's a two-tier quantitative screening which looks at business activity and financial ratio. Currently, about 80% of the stocks in Malaysia are Shara compliant, so there are a lot of Shara compliant stocks. For investors who are interested in that, okay, and by investing in Malaysian share compliance stocks, you are also yeah you are also confident in the fact that there are people that are monitoring these stocks to make sure they continue to be share compliant. And number seven, returns for share compliance stocks are not worse off, and they could have better down downside risk as I've shown just now. And lastly, stock picking is key to outperform in the Malaysian market. Okay, that's the end of my presentation. Okay, sure. Thank you very much, Jason, for presenting the first half. Okay. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Desmond, and I am from the securities dealing uh, group from uh, FSM. And I'll be sharing on how uh, investors can start to trade on Bursa Malaysia on FSM. Okay, so let me share my screen. In. Okay, so okay, so you are an, an investor that you are looking to trade in Bursa Malaysia. Okay, the first thing that uh, an investor has to do is they have to perform a declaration, which is also known as the Malaysia Residency Declaration. Okay, and this uh, declaration is uh, mandatory for investors who are looking to trade in Bursa Malaysia or to also deactivate the Malaysian Ringgit Cash Account. This is due to the Malaysia regulations to segregate uh, Malaysian Ringgit funds between a Malaysia resident and a non-resident. Okay. So what is the definition of a Malaysian resident? It is generally uh, described as an individual who is in Malaysia for a period or periods amounting to uh, 182 days or more in a calendar year. Then you will be regarded as a Malaysia resident. But if not, then you will be known as a non-resident. So if you are a Singaporean who is uh, living in Singapore, then you will be regarded as a non-resident. Or even if you are a Malaysian who has already obtained a permanent residence 
and let's say you are living in Singapore for now, you are also known as a, a non-resident. Okay. Okay, so there are two ways for you to perform this uh, Malaysia residency declaration. Okay, clients can perform the declaration through the website or through the mobile app. Through the website, clients can perform it through under the account settings. And under the account settings, you should be able to see this uh, Malaysian residency declaration. And you can perform the declaration there. And under the mobile app, will be the same thing under your account settings, activated products, and you should be able to see the Malaysia residency declaration there. Okay, moving on. Okay, so once you have already performed your Malaysia residency declaration, you can now activate your this uh, Malaysian Ringgit cash account. So to trade in Bursa, Bursa Malaysia securities, a client has to first uh, pre-fund their this uh, Malaysian Ringgit cash account. So we are offering uh, this uh, foreign exchange service to our clients, which can be done through the website or through the mobile app as well. So through the web, it will be under the cash solutions where clients can perform the foreign currency exchange. And in the mobile app, it will be under the cash solutions as well, where the foreign currency exchange can be performed there. Okay, so once you click into the foreign currency exchange tab, it will you will see rough, something roughly similar to this. So clients will be able to select the account that they are looking to exchange from, and then they can key in the amount that they are looking to convert, and then the exchange currency will be in ringgit. Then over here, they will prompt you an estimated uh, equivalent exchange amount, which the indicative uh, exchange rate will be shown over here. And currently, there are uh, four uh, currency pairs which are supported uh, by FSM. The SING dollars to MYR. The next one will be USD to MYR, followed by HKD MYR. And the last one is uh, CNH to MYR. Okay, great. So now you have already funded your cash account and you're looking to trade on Bursa Malaysia. So there, as uh, presented by Jason, there are three uh, security markets securities markets on Bursa Malaysia. The first one will be the main market, which is a prime market for established companies that have met the standards in terms of uh, quality, size, and operations. And some familiar names that you might have heard of, uh, which is uh, traded on the main market are Maybank, Top Glove, Nestle, and Maxis. Next is the ACE market, which is a sponsor-driven market designed for companies with uh, growth prospects. This is uh, similar to the Catalyst market, which is uh, listed on the SGX, and also the GEM market, which is the growth enterprise market, which is listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Okay, these two, the main market and the ACE market is uh, to provide companies with greater visibility via the capital market and a clearly defined platform to raise funds for both institutional and uh, retail investors. And the last one is this uh, leap market, which is a platform for small and medium enterprises, SMEs. And they have uh, not met the requirements of the ACE market to raise funds. And currently the leap market is only accessible to sophistic sophisticated investors. And as uh, prescribed under the Capital Markets and uh, Services Act. So currently, uh, FSM only uh, opens the main market and ACE market to FSM clients, and we do not offer uh, trading on the deep market for now. Okay, moving on. Okay, I'll talk about the trading hours on Bursa Malaysia. Malaysia will be trading on Monday to Friday, except on public holidays. And it is divided to two main sessions. The first one will be the morning session, which is uh, continuous trading from 9 in the morning until 12.30 p.m. And the second session will be the afternoon session, which is uh, 2.30 p.m. until 5 p.m. So in between, there will be a break from 12.30 to 2.30, which is a two hours break. Okay. Okay, clients can also place in uh, what we call a next day trade, which is available from 8 p.m. onwards. 
Okay, so let's say uh, today is the uh, 24th and 24th, and you're looking to place a trade for tomorrow morning. So clients can actually place in the trades for tomorrow, uh, 8 p.m. onwards. However, however, the trades will only be routed to the exchange uh, once the exchange uh, reaches its uh, pre-opening phase, which is the 8.30 in the morning session. Okay, moving on, we'll talk about the lot sizes and minimum tick sizes on Bursa. The shares are normally traded in a specific amounts called bot lots, which is uh, 100 units. Any amount less than the bot lots are actually called special lots or odd lots. Okay, and the minimum tick size listed on uh, Bursa for all securities except for the ETF bond-based ETFs, it will be following according to this table, less than one ringgit, it will follow a tick size of 0 0.5 cents, one ringgit to 9.99, it will follow a tick minimum tick size of one cent, 10 ringgit to 99.98, uh, two cents per tick, more than 100 ringgit, it will be 10 cents per tick. And for equity-based uh, exchange traded funds, if it's uh, less than one ringgit, it will follow a minimum tick size of 0 0.1 cents, one ringgit to $2.99.5, it will be 0 0.5 cents, and anything more than three ringgit, it will be one cents per tick. Okay, next I'll talk about the maximum price uh, spread range, which is also known as the maximum bid range. Okay, for all securities on the first day of listing, which is the has the reference price of uh, equal or more than a one ringgit, the upper limit price is uh, four hundred percent on the reference price, and the lower limit will be thirty percent below the reference price. But if the reference price is uh, below one ringgit, the upper limit will be four hundred percent or 30% above the reference price, and the lower limit will be 30% below the reference price. Okay, if the securities is uh, not on the first day of listing, the, if it's, uh, the reference price is uh, one ringgit and above, the upper limit will be 30% of the reference price, and the lower limit will be 30% below. And if it's uh, trading below one ringgit, the upper limit will be 30 cents above the reference price, and the lower limit will be 30 cents below the reference price. Okay, next I'll show you something called uh, dynamic price limits, which uh, the Bursa Malaysia implements. Okay, so the dynamic price limits follows uh, this table. Uh, if the reference price is below one ringgit, it will follow a limit of uh, plus minus 0 0.08 cents. But if it's uh, one ringgit and above, it will has, have a limit of uh, 8% plus minus 8%. So this reference price for the dynamic price limit is actually the price of the last trade. So for example, if the last traded price is one ringgit and the buyer is looking to buy at a 1.09, the order uh, won't be able to go through as it has exceeded the dynamic price limit of 8%. So the maximum price the investor can place in at a time will be one ringgit at eight cents. Okay. Next, I'll be talking about uh, some additional information investors should take note uh, while investing in Bursa Malaysia. The first one will be the settlement period, which is T plus two market days, and the order types which are available on FSM. Currently, for FSM, we only uh, allow limit orders for Bursa Malaysia. And for order validity, we allow day order and good day orders for Bursa Malaysia up to a maximum of 30 days. Okay, and trade amalgamation is also available on our platform for Bursa Trading. And live prices is also available for our clients. And investors will be happy to note that uh, they will be able to enjoy two calendar months of free market data after their first Bursa trade. This market data includes live pricing, live prices streaming, time and sales, and five levels of market depth. Okay, next moving on to odd lots. Okay, buying of odd lots is actually prohibited on, on FSM. And if clients are holding odd lots, they are looking to sell, they aren't able to place it online and they are, will have to call into the dealing hotline to place the offline sell orders for odd lots. Okay, for stock sell orders, the sale proceeds will be credited on into the client's uh, ringgit cash account on T plus three business days after 1.30. Okay, 
So for clients who are in, uh, interested to trade in Bursa Malaysia equities on FSM, it, the fees and charges will be at a minimum of 8 ringgit 80 cents and goes by the per percentage of 0.08%. And uh, exchange uh, specific fees will be as shown in, in this table here. There's an uh, exchange clearing fee of 0.03% on the contract value. And there is also an exchange stamp duty of 0.1% on the contract value. And for ETF trades, uh, the stamp duty will be waived from Bursa Malaysia until the 31st December of uh, 2025. There is also the Malaysia SST, which is uh, implemented on the intermediary broker, which is 6% of the brokerage fee. However, FSM will be absorbing the F SST charge until uh, further notice. And the last one is this uh, goods and services tax, the GST. This will be 7% on each item, which is uh, applicable to all Singapore tax residents. Okay, investors can also uh, find, find this a uh, few useful tools which are avail available on the FSN platform. The first one is the market performance. The next one will be the stock screener. And the last one is the thematic portfolio. Okay, the market performance is, uh, can be found under the stocks homepage. It will show you an overview on the performance of the Bursa Malaysia on the trading day itself. It is actually segregated into different sectors for investors to have a quick overview on how the market is uh, performing according to its uh, individual sectors. They can also click onto it to obtain a uh, more in to see, uh, zoom in onto the stocks that are within the group itself. Okay, next I'll move on to stock screener. So clients can actually uh, perform a uh, fill field. Uh, can set filters to screen their specific stocks they are looking for. They can select their spe specific exchange. So in this case, it will be Bursa Malaysia. And the, uh, the specific sector they are looking to invest in could be basic materials, communi communication services, or energy financial services. And they're able to adjust on their, this uh, range that they are looking for the, based on the dividend yield, P ratio, PB ratio, and stuff, market cap and they can filter filter their specified needs. Then it will show something like this here, where everything is uh, filtered out for the clients. So they are able to screen, screen them accordingly. Okay, next we have this uh, thematic portfolio, which is uh, screened by our this uh, analyst uh, back in FSM. So basically this, this is uh, portfolios, which are in their specific teams. So clients can actually click on the teams that are in interested in, could be aging population, China urbanization. So these teams are actually uh, what we believe that it will have an impact onto the, the investing space. So clients can have a click on these uh, thematic portfolios to have a look into it. So let's say clients is uh, interested in this uh, income focus list. So it will show roughly a few, few names which are included in this uh, segment. However, uh, for Bursa, Bursa uh, it's not available for now uh, on this uh, thematic portfolio. Okay, so if clients are looking to search and filter like on, let's say on the top volume based on the trading day itself, this can be found in the live trading page. So they are able to filter by Bursa and they can filter by this uh, specific uh, filters. Could be volume traded, top gainers by price, top losers by price. So all of this uh, will be filtered uh, accordingly and will be shown accordingly based on your filter. Okay, and in case clients are looking to search for a specific stock, they can actually go to the search bar and type in the specific stock name. In this case, if clients are interested in, let's say, Maxis, they can just key in the Maxis and it should show up something like this. And all this is the stock fact sheet where all the available information about the stock can be found from here. And if clients are interested in uh, trading in this uh, stock specific stock itself, they can click on, on this uh, live, trading, tr live trading bar here, and it will show up the live trading page where clients can uh, perform buy sells from there. 
Okay, so that's all from my end. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you so much to all our viewers tonight. And also thank you, Desmond, for sharing with us about how we can get started and the important things to look out for uh, on Bursa Malaysia. Uh, so to our wonderful audience, we hope you found the uh, session helpful. Uh, do stay tuned, of course, to fsm1.com as we uh, continue to bring you more updates uh, and investing ideas uh, around the world, as well as on Buza, Malaysia. Uh, so with that, um, we'd like to thank you all for your kind attention. Uh, stay healthy, stay safe, and all the best in your investment journey. Thank you all and good night. <laughs>